Hi, it's Kevin Don, the Get Fit Guy. Last week on the podcast, we discussed the importance of squats and how to perform them. But what do we do if we find that our technique is down to physical deficiencies? Today, I'm going to talk about the most common errors and how to fix them. Now, first of all, I think it'd be a good idea just to recap the learnings from last week, which are that in terms of the squat, we're looking for the following points of performance. Firstly, that you're able to bend at the hips and the knees simultaneously. It's common due to sedentary lifestyles, office-based work, the sitting most of the day, that people lack the ability to make this pattern. Most common thing I see is people bending their knees first. This leads to heels lifting off the floor as we approach the bottom of the squat, which is, of course, unstable. Secondly, whilst you perform the squat or lunges, the knee should stay tracking over the middle of the foot with a vertical shin. If the knee drifts inwards, that's called knee valgus, and that's been positively correlated with knee injuries. It's more common in women because of differently shaped pelvis causing more of an angle of the thigh bone or femur from hip to knee, which is called the angle of Q. Similarly, it's important that we have a strong core, able to hold our torso in a fixed position. As we move, we add load, and you'll find that a deformable lever, the torso being the lever here, is a poor transmitter of force. We also want to squat as deep as we can whilst maintaining the above. Deep squats are not bad for your knees if they track centrally. Strength is gained in the range it's trained, so if you do shallow squats, you won't ever be strong in a deep position. We've covered the said principles in the past which define specificity. Now, it's important we got to distinguish things in terms of there being two major camps that any loaded movement will fall into. First of all, you have poor motor control. That means you just can't make the pattern required. Secondly, you're just not strong enough. It's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. Which one you find yourself in will affect the way you address the problem. So let's say you go to this gym, you warm up your squats, you start with some unloaded air squats, which, by the way, I would always recommend. The best warm-up for squats is squats. So you're warming up, and they look great. So you move to the 45-pound barbell, still looking good. 65 pounds, 95 pounds, 135, 155, 185, they all look and feel great. At 195, your knees suddenly begin to collapse, your back starts to round, and your eyeballs come out your head on stocks. This right here is a case of just not strong enough. I know this because every preceding set and rep was good. If, on the other hand, you're making any of the major points of performance issues mentioned above from the get-go, including during the warm-up, well, you, my friend, just don't have motor control yet. So how would we go about fixing these problems? Well, if you just aren't strong enough yet, it's pretty simple. You get stronger. So I'd back off the load and increase the dose. Like in the example above, the squats were good at 185, but the wheels fell off at 195. So you'd back off to 185 and perform a higher volume of reps there to groove the pattern at what would be a pretty high percentage of your rep max. This increase in dose response might be enough to break the plateau. So let's say you're doing sets of five. You might push it up to sixes or eights or one of my personal favorites, which is failure minus one which is where you'll stop one rep before you feel like things are about to go awry. In terms of motor control failure, it's very likely that you need to squat without any heavy load right now and focus on tempo air squats, goblet squats, but let's look at the common errors listed. In some ways, I might choose to help my clients fix those. First of all, early knee bend or lack of hip movement. This one's pretty easy to see. The client will have most of their weight on the toes in the squat and may, as they approach the bottom position, have their heels begin to lift. There are myriad ways to fix all these things. Some verbal cueing, such as put your weight mid-foot, put your heels down. I prefer to use tactile cues because it can be hard to implement a verbal cue if it's a new movement or something you're unsure of. 
There was a great coach called Mark Ribito who uses tubo, which is terribly useful block of wood, which he puts in front of a client's knees. And the goal is to not let the knees touch it on the way down. I like to use a plyometric box and set the lifter up with the calves touching the box and perform a squat. If the calves leave the box, we know they did a knee slide and reset and keep going until they're able to use the hips more as they settle into the squat and keep the calves in contact with the box. Now, knee valgus, which is where the knees cave in or collapse towards the midline of the body. This one, again, we could use some tactile cueing. If I were with the lifter here, I could place my hands outside their knees, tell them to push their knees out to touch my hands as they squat down. Or I could also use what's called RNT training, which stands for reactive neuromuscular training, where I could take a band and place it around their quads just above the knee, and they would have to be actively pushing out against the band, which would be pulling their knees together. I love this one because many situations we find this uh, is down to weak external hip rotators, and this will strengthen those which are mainly the glutes, and this goes a long way to addressing the knee valgus problem and mitigating any injury potential. Torso collapsing in the squat. This is another one that's going to be more about static isometric holds than ab exercises. You know, doing 100 crunches is one thing, but it doesn't carry over directly to maintaining a single contraction at, let's say, a 3-2-1-2 tempo, which would be six sections of isometric contraction. So rather than doing abdominal work, you'd do things like, you know, plank hollow holds on the floor, GHD, Sorensen holds, straight arm planks. Those are all going to be more useful here. Fifth, we've got shallow squats. It's mostly down to people just not having exposure to the correct range of motion. I've had plenty of lifters who claim to me that they lack the mobility to perform a deep squat. I throw them a ball to sit on to rest while I go and get something for them, and they have no problem squatting on the ball. So this is literally the fix for that. Have people squat to an object, and over time, lower the target that they have to squat to so that they end up where we want in terms of depth. Like I said, there are many fixes, also many problems. In the absence of injury or actual mobility issues, it's usually going to be motor control or strength problems that we come across. And I hope some of these ideas that we discussed today will help you to overcome any squat issues you might have. As always, feel free to reach out to me with any specific questions I can help you with. Get Fit Guy is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to the team at Quick and Dirty Tips, Adam Cecil, Morgan Christensen, Holly Hutchings, and Davina Tomlin. The intern is Cameron Lacey. I'm your host, Kevin Don. If you have a question for me, leave me a voice note at 510-353-3104 or send me an email at getfitguy at quickanddirtytips.com. For more information about the show, visit quickanddirtytips.com or check out the show notes in your podcast app.